Please take your Bibles and turn with me to Psalm 91, what is frequently referred to as the soldier's psalm. Psalm 91, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. For it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and bulwark. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day, of the pestilence that stalks in darkness or of the destruction that lays waste at noon. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not approach you you will only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. For you have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high, because he has known my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. The soldier's song, speaking of the security that we have in the shelter of our great God and how blessed we are for such a confidence that is ours. We begin, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High. Here we're talking about an abiding. Jesus spoke in John's Gospel of us abiding in the vine, that there needed to be that continuous attachment. It is not that the branches could go for day trips or that they could just check in on a holy day, for instance, the Sabbath, or as we worship on Sundays, that there could be a periodic dipping in to religious or spiritual holy things, and then they could go on their way to check out what other options and what other fun there is had in the world. Here, Psalm 91, it all flows out of this abiding, out of this dwelling, then in the shelter of the Most High. The psalmist would not have been able to recount these blessings, which are laid out in such a plain way, if there had not been that first point. If the Lord, if the Most High, if the Almighty, had not been that place where there was an abiding, a dwelling. Our world misses that. Our world misunderstands and completely avoids it. For there is a desire to have both the cake and to eat it at the same time. But the psalmist, he... The person who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, they will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. In Israel, the sun can be a vicious foe. 
and for those who have dwelt in the wilderness or in a desert in a parched land, a sh place of shade, a shadow is a precious thing. Here the psalmist says that that shadow of the Almighty will be such a blessing. The second verse says, I will say to the Lord, there is a communication that's taking place. There is a prayer that is offered up. There is a privilege. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they communed with God. And what a wonderful thing that God would come down in the evening, in the cool of the day, to walk with Adam and Eve. And what a tragedy when that time that God came down to walk with them once again and he found that all was broken because of sin. But in the tabernacle in the wilderness that was erected through the exodus of the Jews, there was once again a communion which was taking place, but yet there were barriers. The women the Jewish women could come so far and no farther, the Jewish men a little farther in, and succession it went, the Levites closer and the sons of Aaron, the priests, farther in yet. The high priest into the Holy of Holies only once a year. And yet the psalmist, there is an intimacy which cuts across all of that he prays to the Lord and there is a confidence that that prayer has been and is heard. I will say to the Lord, I, not passing it through the priest, but he says, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress. There is a personal aspect here he claims this as his own. God is the one who is his defender. He is his protector. My refuge, the place where I am safe. And he says, my God, not just my fortress and my refuge, but my God, my God, in whom I trust. A word of confident personal, personal testimony. Not the God of my parents or my grandparents, not the confidence or the trust of someone else, the pastor or the church elders or some super saint from long ago. The psalmist drills down here and says, my God and the one in whom I am trusting. It is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. It's the person who hasn't lived very long that doesn't know there are dangers in this world, all kinds of dangers. The psalmist knew perfectly well of these things, but he says, even though there are traps even though there are things that would stalk in darkness, such as pestilence, yet, verse 4, he will cover you with his pinions and under his wings, as we sang, under his wings. Under his wings you may seek the refuge that you need. His faithfulness is a shield and bulwark. He is not capricious. He is not flighty. His faithfulness remains even through our unfaithfulness. The faithfulness of God is unsurpassed. Verse 5, you will not be afraid of the terror by night. Once again, calling this the soldier's psalm. Very often the night is the time of the greatest terror, though the enemy might try to gain advantage through the cover of darkness. The Lord, he is the one 
who is, the, who is there to strengthen his people, that they not be terrorized, that they not be made afraid by the night and the cover of darkness. You will not be afraid of the terror by night or of the arrow that flies by day. That dart which is sent directly in your direction. Psalmist says you're not going to be afraid of that. The pestilence that stalks in darkness or of the destruction that lays waste in the middle of the day, right at noontime. And though you might think with the light of day you could see things coming, yet it just isn't so. The Lord says, I'm going to protect you from all of those things to which you are so vulnerable. Verse 7, a thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. You will only look on with your eyes. You will simply be a spectator to what is going on round about you. It will not be that which touches you. You will only look on with your eyes and see what the recompense, what the wages is of those who do evil, the recompense of the wicked. And the reason for all of these things comes in verse 9. You have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High your dwelling place. Coming back to verse 1 and tying this midpoint and the first verse together. You have made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling. Your dwelling. What is your dwelling, spiritually speaking? What is your spiritual address? Is it under the shelter of the Most High? Are you dwelling there? Or, as I said before, do you go out for day trips or are there periodic spiritual excursions as it is where you leave that protected place, where you go out and try what the world has to offer, what the gods of our own hands, to see whether they satisfy better than the Most High? What a foolish thing. What a ridiculous and foolish thing that is. Verse 10. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. He will give his angels charge concerning you. You remember that Satan, when he was tempting Jesus in the wilderness through those after that time of 40 days of Jesus fasting, and the devil came to him and said, look, the angels are going to take care of you. You can do whatever you want. Misapplying this psalm. But God will give his angels charge concerning you. In Hebrews chapter 1, we read that angels are God's ministering spirits sent out for our blessing. Sent out as heaven's emissaries to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You will trample down. They will be underfoot. And here in the last three verses, because he has loved me. Here, the psalmist is writing not as someone who has been conscripted into God's army or conscripted into God's service. Here is a love slave. In the Law of Moses, there were instructions given as to those who would come 
in indebtedness in in uh, in uh, for some reason into slavery or into service and there were stipulations given as to exactly how a person could free themselves however at the end of a period of service a servant might say i love my master and i do not want to go out as a free man and so that person was to be taken to the doorpost and their earlobe was to be pierced with an awl. And they were no longer to have the liberty of going out as a free individual, but they were to serve for all of their days. But they were not there against their will. They were there because they loved their master. In a similar way, the Lord would call us to be love slaves to him. Not that we come to him with our arm twisted up around our back and say, oh, I don't want to go, but I don't have any other choice. But the Lord would show his love to us, that he would beckon us, that he would reach out to us, and that we would come to him willingly and gladly for all that he has done for us. We read that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we read that because of this love that it's only right that we love him in return. It's not that we started the love relationship. We love him because he first loved us. That is the most startling thing of God's grace. It is not that we, in the desperation of our need, cried out to him and said, Lord, would you do something about our aching need? But that when we were spitting and when we were mocking him, he was reaching out to us in love. Not when we were beautiful did he love us, but when we were sinful and marred, when we were hideous in our sins. Yet the love of God reached out, reached down to us in our point of need. When we would say, Lord, stay away from me, I'm holier than you. He, knowing better, was the one who reached down in love for us. Here the psalmist, in a similar way, says in verse 14, Because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. God is looking down upon each and every one who is seeking his shelter and seeking to abide there, God says, not because they are constrained to serve me, but because they come with glad hearts, because they come with love for me, because this one has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him securely on high. Once again, person who is constrained, who is forced against their will to serve the Lord, they'll be looking for any opportunity to bolt out the door and for them to take those spiritual excursions to go out from under the shelter of the Most High. But the person who has said, I've seen all that I care to see of this world I have tasted of its joys and I have found them to be nothing but bitterness. I have experienced the best that this world has to offer and it has left me hungry. It has left me unsatisfied. And they come to the Lord and they say, Lord, all of my joy, all of my hope, all of my delight is in you. That person is not looking for those excursions or those side trips 
or those times when they might bolt out the door, at least for a little bit, at least for a little taste of what the world has to offer. But they come and they say, Lord, all my delight, all my joy, all of my treasure is in you. My love is for you and for you alone. Well, God looks down and he says, because he has loved me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set such a one securely on high because he has known my name. Repeatedly through the Old Testament, we have the words, I am the Lord. I've repeatedly said to you that that comes as a starting point out of Moses' interaction with Pharaoh in the court of Egypt. When Pharaoh said, and who is the Lord? Moses and Aaron had gone in before Pharaoh and said, Pharaoh, the Lord says, let my people go that they might serve me. Pharaoh, he esteemed himself as a higher authority than this God of these slaves. And so he said, you've got to be kidding. I am not going to let the people go. I am a greater authority. I am on a higher level. Who is the Lord? Through 10 plagues, Pharaoh would learn exactly who the Lord was. Those 10 plagues, they were addressed and sent as a target, especially towards the gods of Egypt. And each of the gods of Egypt they were knocked on their rear end. They were knocked to the ground. Who is the Lord? God says, I am the Lord. That is my name. Here the psalmist in verse 14 says, I will set him securely on high because he has known my name. He knows who I am. He knows my power. He knows my authority. He knows what I can do, that I am able to reward, and I am also able to withhold reward. I am the one who bested the gods of Egypt, though they were considered so mighty and so powerful. Yet I was demonstrated in perfect clarity to be supreme over them all. I will set him securely on high because he has known who I really am and he has honored me. He has come by faith, we might say. He will call upon me, verse 15, and I will answer him. What a privilege to know that when we call upon the Lord, that we will have both a hearing and an answer. It may not be exactly the answer that we wish for or that we have petitioned for, but we are ever and always confident that it is the answer of God's gracious hand that he is working all things for our good. He will call upon me and I will answer him I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. I will be with him. We go to Isaiah's prophecy to hear of the promise of Emmanuel, that God with us would be the name of Jesus when he would come to be born in Bethlehem and when he would dwell in Nazareth, and then for those three years with his disciples, God with us, God Emmanuel. But here in the psalm, it says, I will be Emmanuel to him in trouble. I'll be right there. 
I will rescue him and honor him. With a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. The goodness of God. Oh, how foolish, how foolish it is when we get our eyes off of our God, when we forget, as it says here, his name, when we let that slip from our grasp, when we do not know the name of God and his power, it is then that we toy with danger and trouble when we imperil ourselves unnecessarily. Dear friend, I would bid you to dwell, dwell, tabernacle, whatever word you want to use, abide, stay, remain in the shelter of the Most High and to abide constantly forever in the shadow of the Almighty. Lord, I give you thanks and praise for the privilege of declaring your word here from the soldier's psalm, Psalm 91. So work this into each and every one of our hearts, and may we hear with the power of the Holy Spirit driving it home what these privileges and what these blessings of confident trust are that come from your hand. So, Lord, work your purposes in us. These mercies we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.